Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Philip Rosebaum, the SDCU IPM coordinator and field technician for Dr. Varenhorst, who is speaking today. Um, he is a state entomologist. I'm glad you could join us for our pest and crop webinar. This is our third one so far, and hopefully we'll continue uh, doing these every Thursday until mid-late August or until, you know, the season cools down a little bit. Um, the announcement for this, which you're here, so you obviously uh, got to it already, but uh, we'll always have the announcement every Monday in the newsletter. Um, and then, so just look for that every Monday in the newsletter. Um, some basics for this webinar. Uh, the Q&A button or the chat button, you can use either or, is in the bottom of your Zoom window. Click on either of those and at any time during the presentation, uh, type a question if you have any. Um, and then also, uh, both of these talks today, um, you can get half a CCA credit. Um, and at the very end of each presentation, uh, we'll display the QR code on your screen. Um, and if you want that half credit, you'll have to scan that QR code with your phone. Um, so with that covered, our first speaker today is Emmanuel Bayumukama. <laughs> Sorry, Emmanuel. Uh, he's Associate Professor and SDSU Extension Plant Pathologist, and he's presenting uh, Scouting for Early Season Diseases in Field Crops. Uh, so with that, Emmanuel, take it away. All right, thanks, Phil. As soon as I have the rights to share my screen, I'll load up the presentation. Let's see here. Um, Adam, can you do that? I think you are co-host. There we go. Okay, I think I still can't share my screen. All right, there we go. Okay, so still waiting for this PowerPoint to load. Okay, maybe not there. All right, so uh, can everyone see my slides? Yep, looks good. Awesome. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. So as Phil mentioned this afternoon, I'll be sharing with you uh, some of the diseases we need to be aware of as the uh, plant establishes, but also as the season progresses. And so we'll cover our root rots and then also early foliar diseases that we need to be aware of. So as we're all aware, um, when uh, ceilings don't emerge, uh, certain problems uh, can be thought of uh, to be causing uh, a poor plant stand establishment. It could be a faulty planter uh, or um, it could be because of various uh, uh, problems. Uh, sometimes where you see a whole entire row is not emerging, most likely that's not going to be because of a disease, but perhaps because of either the depth of planting or maybe that particular hose uh, got plugged and the seeds did not come out or they were just uh, buried too deep. So there are a number of issues, as I was saying, that might cause uh, ceilings not to emerge. Uh, but for my talk, we're going to concern ourselves with plant pathogens. So a number of plant pathogens can cause uh, either seed to rot before it germinates or for the seedling to die shortly after germination. Uh, as you can see in this picture, um, we have the seeds that uh, just rot, they rotted in the soil uh, before they could emerge. And then uh, you also have uh, this seedling that just germinated, but then couldn't emerge because of the uh, pathogens. Here you have a seedling that has no roots just because they were rotten because of plant pathogens. And here you can see also these seedlings, much as they emerge, they really look terrible because of uh, uh, pathogens. So there are a number of uh, pathogens that are going to cause uh, these uh, problems in seedlings. And the four that I'm showing here are the most common ones. Uh, Phytophthora soja is common in soybeans. Pythium uh, can affect any crop. 
Rhizoctonia affects mainly in soybean, but you can also find it in other crops, as well as Fusarium, uh, which is uh, very common in, in a lot of crops. So for Phytophthora, which is common in, uh, in soybeans, uh, this disease is going to kill uh, seedlings, gonna cause seed decay even before the seed germinates, and um, it can kill plants throughout the season. And one way to know that you have the Phytophthora problem is to look for the rotting that is extensive and extends above the soil line. Uh, the color is usually dark brown, and as, as I mentioned, you usually see extensive root rotting. Uh, however, the roots remain there and um, they are not clipped as we shall see in other pathogens that cause root rot and seedling uh, dying. Uh, as compared here to the healthy seedling, you can see it's already progressing well, uh, whereas these that are infected, uh, they are going to be stunted if they don't, if they are not killed by this disease. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this disease will continue to kill plants throughout the season. Uh, here's an example um, of uh, uh, a plant that has Phytophthora root rot, and again, you can see that brown, uh, dark brown color that extends above the soil line, which is a characteristic of Phytophthora root rot. Now, the other root rots usually are not going to extend above the soil line. So if you see this either early in the season or throughout the season, that most likely is going to be because of Phytophthora. So Pythium is another common root rot that can take out seedlings, also cause uh, seeds to die before they germinate or shortly after germination. And this uh, root rot is not quite easy to tell from Phytophthora, uh, but it's gonna cause more of the reddish color uh, on the seedling that is dying because of this disease. Uh, and also they tend to appear marshy. So if you see marshy, rotting, kind of soft, uh, rotted plant tissue uh, early in the season, that likely is gonna be due to Pythium. Um, so the good thing with Pythium is once the plant is past V2, um, as the plant uh, grows past the seedling stage, it becomes more resistant to Pythium. So plants that are killed a bit later in the season are likely not to be due to Pythium, but perhaps because of other uh, pathogens. So Pythium, as I mentioned, is pretty common in uh, cross crops. So wheat, corn, soybean, sunflower, and other crops. Uh, and uh, the one characteristic that is gonna uh, let us know we have Pythium is where you have this kind of collapsed tissue uh, on the roots that are rotting. Uh, that is gonna be a characteristic of uh, Pythium root rot. So then Fusarium root rot is common across a number of crops. Uh, this is characterized by limited roots on the, on the plant. So a lot of secondary roots are lost because of uh, Fusarium. So sometimes you just pull the plant and you only see the main root. Uh, when that happens, that is likely to be caused by the Fusarium pathogen. Um, the color is usually uh, dark brown as seen on these soybean plants. Um, but if you split the stem, sometimes you might see a little bit of pinkish color, uh, which might be an indication of Fusarium root rot. So uh, Fusarium, again, is, is common across a number of crops. And the other disease that's caused by Fusarium is uh, sudden death syndrome that um, a lot of us are aware of. Uh, so this disease actually is gonna be seen later in the growing season, but actually the infection happens right after a seedling emergence in soybeans. So uh, where we have excessive moisture and uh, where the plant is, the, the variety that was planted is susceptible, uh, you can have sudden death uh, develop. Uh, but again, the idea here is that the, the pathogen infects soybean plants right after seedling germination, after seedling emergence, and then the symptoms do show up much later in the season. So that's one thing we need to be aware of. Uh, going forward. So again, Fusarium species are gonna affect a lot of crops. So in corn also, we've seen cases of Fusarium developing in corn seedlings and killing those plants. So as seen here, uh, if uh, 
a corn plant has fusarium, you're gonna see this internal rotting and discoloration uh, caused by the fusarium pathogen. You may also see some rotting uh, of the roots, but mainly these lower parts of the plant are going to be rotted and, uh, uh, color and discolored as well. So one of the common uh, roots in, in, in corn are going to be caused by fusarium. Um, as I mentioned, pythium is likely to be more of a problem early on in the season and not uh, as seedlings grow, they become a bit resistant to pythium. So rhizotonia is another root rot that can cause damping off, you know, when seedlings are killed uh, shortly after emergence or even before emergence. Um, so here, one characteristic of rhizoctonia is this kind of sunken lesion around the stem. Uh, that is going to be typical of a rhizoctonia in soybeans. Um, in small grains, you can also have rhizoctonia, something called rhizoctonia perch. Uh, but this is not something we see commonly in small grains here in South Dakota. Uh, we see rhizoctonia rural to be more of a problem in soybeans. Again, the characteristic of this disease is to look for this sunken lesion around the stems or around the main root, the top root, and that would be a characteristic of a rhizoctonia root rot. So then in small grains, we also have issues that are caused by root and crown rots. Uh, the first one is the common root rot, and as the name suggests, this is one disease we see a little bit frequently and they, it's caused by a, a fungal pathogen called by Pararis sorokiniana. And the typical symptom is the discoloration of the subcron uh, part of the plant. So where you are pulled a plant and you see this area uh, discolored, most likely that is gonna be caused by the, the common root rot uh, disease. And the roots may remain uh, healthy, but sometimes you may also have roots rotting as a result of a common root uh, development. The other thing that we need to also be aware when it comes to root and crown rots in small grains is that you may not see the symptoms. The plant may limp on, uh, but at, around the time of heading, when you see some of these plants having white heads, uh, the problem could be because of these root rots. Uh, and the two common ones are common root rot caused by, by pararis. And then uh, the other one is uh, fusarium uh, root and crown rot, uh, which is the next one that I'm mentioning here. So the difference between common root rot and crown root rot caused by fusarium is going to be where you're seeing symptoms. So uh, for fusarium that is causing the crown area to be rotted has this kind of brown discoloration, but it's above uh, the crown uh, above the subcrown area. Uh, so it extends uh, to the lower nodes, the lower internodes. And so that's how you know you have fusarium and not a common rot. And if these stems are split, sometimes you may see a pink discoloration uh, in these lower nodes. Again, that would be an indication of fusarium root rot, fusarium crown and root rot. So what are some of the risk factors that we need to be aware of that increase the risk of root, uh, root and seedling rots? So the first one is gonna be um, the field history. So uh, field history where a field has had these diseases in the past, uh, definitely you have the inoculum and it's go that's gonna be uh, the first risk factor. The second f factor is gonna be the moisture level in the soil. So where fields have uh, poor drainage and excessive moisture, then you're gonna have uh, issues with some of these diseases like pythium, like uh, phytophthora, as well as the sudden death syndrome. Uh, so the moisture encourages uh, some of these uh, pathogens that produce motile spores to swim in the film of water. And that means that uh, our roots are going to be exposed to the inoculum. So uh, the level of moisture in the soil shortly after planting might increase the risk of these diseases. Of course, if you plant a susceptible variety and where also the, the quality of seed is poor, which means that either the seed might be carrying the pathogen or you have seed 
damage. Uh, all these factors may lead to poor plant stand, poor plant stand establishment uh, where the, the, the seedling may die shortly or even the seed may not germinate. So um, we are now going to look at some of the practices we can use to control these problems. Of course, here it should be mentioned that uh, seedling and root rots cannot be managed uh, during the season, except that uh, we have to do these things prior to planting. So uh, of course, where resistance is available, we need to use resistance to manage root rots. Um, and for Phytophthora, we do have resistance available. However, the resistance genes that we need to deploy uh, need to be noted here that RPS 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are the most effective, uh, whereas the RPS 1 uh, and 7 are not as effective. They are usually defeated by the isolates we find in South Dakota. So uh, better still, if you can find a variety with more than one gene, uh, that would be more effective in managing Phytophthora. And then for fields that have had uh, plant establishment issues, uh, a seed treatment may be considered. So fungicide seed treatments are, can help preserve plant stand and maintain plant vigor. And so for the common problems, especially in soybeans, that is Phytophthora, Pythium, and sudden death, we can use seed treatments to help uh, preserve plant stand. And so for Phytophthora and Pythium, we need to use three active ingredients. One of them would be as good, so metaroxo, mefenoxam, and oxanthiopiprorin. These are the ones that are effective against Phytophthora. For sudden death, we need to be, to be using uh, fluopyram and pyrophromethorphan. So these two active ingredients uh, help with sudden death syndrome. So then for rhizoctonia and fusarium, we have several uh, um, products out there that can help us manage those problems. So other practices that we can use uh, to manage the seedling and uh, root rots include crop rotation, especially where the pathogens do not have a wide host range. Uh, we can use uh, drainage, improved drainage can help prevent a lot of, or at least reduce the risk of most of these root rot diseases, especially Phytophthora, Pythium, and sudden death syndrome. And then maintaining a balanced soil fertility levels can help, especially where you reduce the over in small grains uh, where that might increase the risk of a number of diseases. So with that, then we'll move to look at all the foliar diseases we need to be aware of uh, that can affect yield and how we can manage them. So we start with soybeans and a number of other diseases I can uh, establish on our crop. Uh, the first one being Sarcospora leaf spot. This is a seed borne disease. And so depending on what the quality of the seed you're using, you could introduce the disease in the field through seed. So these plants were grown in the greenhouse and you know, in the greenhouse, we try to control the environment. So we don't have uh, any other source of inoculum. So definitely it's coming from the seed. So as can be seen here on the left picture, this would be a typical symptom of Cercospora uh, where you have the puppering towards the edge of the leaf. Uh, so that's one disease that we might see in, in plants that are emerging. Uh, we also have some virus problems. Here's an example of the tobacco streak virus. You can see this seedling is very stunted compared to the healthy seeds that were planted. So again, if you see plants that are stunted and they're not, they're not they're not establishing well, this could be a, a problem uh, where the, path, the seed was carrying the pathogen. Here's another example of a seed borne disease. This is a P, P, P seed borne mosaic virus. Uh, this structure actually was taken somewhere near um, a pier in, in Hughes County. So uh, again, illustrating that the quality of seed can be important. Uh, if, the, if these seedlings are infected early in the season, they probably not make it or give us any grain. We have a brown spot or septoria leaf spot in soybeans. That's an early disease that can establish uh, in soybeans. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see here, these lower leaves 
are really heavily infected and they will probably may drop uh, prematurely. Uh, luckily, this disease does not affect yield uh, when you have it just on the older foliage on lower leaves, uh, but where soybean is susceptible and is planted soybean on soybean, you could have this disease continue to develop throughout the season. And if you have several leaves that are dropping prematurely, then yes, that might affect uh, your yield potential. In small grains, we have a number of diseases that can affect wheat uh, early on in the season. The first one being tan spot. So tan spot is going to be common and a problem where you have a straw from previous crop, as you can see here in this picture. And so if you have uh, quite an early onset of this disease, definitely this will affect the uh, tearing, the plant vigor, and potentially the yield in the end. So here are a few more pictures showing us the straw being the source of the disease and the heavy leaf spotting uh, on the lower leaves because of, of tan spots. So powdery mildew is another disease we are likely to see in small grains. In fact, uh, fields scouted this week uh, showing some powdery mildew starting to develop. And, and as you can see here in this picture, though not very clear, but you can see really heavy foliage and uh, many tillers uh, which you know, don't encourage air movement within the lower canopy. And so with high humidity and where you have also plant residue from previous season, then powdery mildew can be a problem. But where you have um, not so high a population of plants at the seeds that were planted or where nitrogen is applied uh, in a split way. So some nitrogen in the fall and then some nitrogen in the spring. Usually you don't see a lot of powdery mildew issues unless the variety is really super susceptible. So uh, again, because of the moisture we're already having and the humidity that's starting to, to show up, uh, we might see more of powdery mildew develop in small grains. Another disease that we're seeing uh, is going to be the viruses. So we we're seeing bi-yellow dwarf and wheat streak mosaic showing up in winter wheat. Um, and I wanted to draw here a distinction between uh, bi-yellow dwarf and wheat streak mosaic virus. So for bi-yellow dwarf, you're usually going to see the purpling reddish color on the leaves and this, the severe symptoms are going to start from the tip of the leaf. And also the upper leaves are likely to show more symptoms and you may have the lower leaves even uh, being symptomless. But for wheat streak, um, you have this mosaic pattern where you have the green and yellow streaks that are mixed on a leaf. And so this would be a wheat streak. So it's very easy not to confuse um, body aerodraft dwarf and wheat streak mosaic virus. And sometimes the symptoms for wheat streak are going to be severe starting from the bottom are going up. So it's kind of the opposite. Body aerodraft dwarf, you have the top leaves showing more symptoms. And for wheat streak, you have more symptoms showing from the lower leaves going up. So again, the, the easier distinction between these two viruses is to look at the patterns of the symptoms and the colors, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me, for wheat streak, it's going to be mainly the yellow and green streaks that are mixed on the leaf, forming that mosaic. And for bi dwarf, it's going to be the reddening and the puppering of the leaves uh, starting from the leaf tip. So um, in oats, one disease that really can affect yield is the crown rust. Crown rust can affect plants early on in the season. Um, and if not controlled, if you're growing that oat for uh, grain, then you will have a yield loss caused by this disease. And the reason crown rust is a big problem in oats is because of the inoculum. This inoculum comes from the backthorns. So we have plenty of backthorns, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in the eastern part of the state. And so we're not short of inoculum. So this is one of the few rusts that can survive in our environment. And that's why we usually have a such a high level of the disease in oats. 
So if you're planting a susceptible variety as can be seen on this uh, variety on the right, and <clears throat> excuse me, if uh, uh, a fungicide is not applied, you can really have severe heat losses caused by a crown rust. But likely we do have very good resistant varieties, uh, including Dion, Warrior, Sado, and Sumo. So if you plant those, you would not need a fungicide because they are pretty resistant against uh, crown rust. So th those are the, the diseases we need to be aware of, especially starting uh, of the season, of course, for corn and soybean. Uh, for small grains, we're already somewhat uh, moving on. For winter wheat, we have some fields that are already heading. So the set of diseases that you're gonna see in winter wheat at this level uh, are going to be different from what you see, for example, in spring wheat, which is just greening up. So for fungal leaf diseases, um, when it comes to management, what are some of the things we need to be aware of as the season progresses? So for soybeans, the other diseases that we see mainly brown, stem, brown uh, spot or septor septoria leaf spot, uh, this disease, as I mentioned, doesn't concern us so much early in the season uh, because it does not result in uh, severe or significant yield losses. Um, however, if it is a problem um, in the crop, a fine side that is applied at R3, R4 will be effective and will preserve yield loss. So we don't have to worry about this disease until later on in the season. Uh, and of course, when it comes to uh, disease management in soybean, uh, we can apply a fine side to manage uh, white mold. And so that fine side needs to be applied at R1. Uh, we can also apply a fungi to manage frog eye leaf spot, and that needs to be applied um, at least R4. And then for other diseases, the best timing is R3, R4 uh, for soybeans. So um, we need to be aware that the timing of a fungi will influence how that fungi will be, will be effective. And of course, for white mold management, also the product you use and the volume of spray also influence how effective that fungicide will be. So for oats, uh, especially if these oats are raised for grain, we need to scout and apply a fungicide right at the flag leaf emergence. As I mentioned, this disease is pretty common in South Dakota. We have a lot of inoculum. And so we will not be short of the disease. The last seven years I've been here, I've seen this disease every season and it has been very severe. So either we are we are using a resistant variety or we are planning a fungicide if we have a, a susceptible variety and if we are raising the, uh, the old crop for grain. Uh, even when we're raising the crop for forage, uh, the, this rust can affect the quality of the, of the forage. So again, there I would recommend using a resistant variety because uh, uh, spraying a fungicide uh, in oats for forage may not be profitable may not, may not be economical. And then for small grains, uh, the diseases we're seeing now, depending on the level of the crop uh, development, uh, we have to weigh between where the crop is, the level of the disease that is developing, and then the decision to apply a fungicide. And so for wheat, for winter wheat that is at flag leaf or in boot, or where the head is emerging, but the flag leaf and the two leaves blow flag leaf appear clean. Uh, we don't have to apply a fungicide at this stage. So we can keep scouting and then apply a fungicide at flowering. This would be for scab management. And therefore that way uh, we can use just one fungicide timing that will take care of FHB uh, or Fusarium head blight and also uh, leaf diseases. However, for uh, the wheat crops that are still uh, where the flag leaf has not emerged and we're seeing tan spot or powdery mildew developing, the environment we're having at the moment is really conducive for these diseases to continue developing and therefore we would need to protect the flag leaf and the, the top upper leaves to make sure that they don't get diseased because these leaves do contribute the most to yield. So the decision to apply a fungicide 
uh, for small grains should be based on the level of the crop development as well as the amount of disease that, you, that is developing. The important leaves to protect are going to be the flag leaf and the leaf blow flag leaf, uh, which are the most contributors to yield. So for fine style that should be applied for scab, again, this should be uh, determined based on the risk of the disease. And we have tools that can help us to assess the level of the disease. And these tools basically use the weather variables, mainly relative humidity and temperature to determine the risk of the disease. And so based on what we're seeing at the moment, uh, we've had plenty of moisture, the, temp the temperatures are warming up and therefore the risk seems to be high as can be seen here in this uh, prediction map of South Dakota. So almost everywhere where wheat is grown in South Dakota is at a uh, high risk for Fusarium head blight. So luckily right now, you know, wheat is just starting to head. So it might be another 10 days before we see flowering. But for the wheat fields that are coming into heading and flowering, I would recommend using a fungicide to control a scab uh, because this disease can cause uh, a lot of yield loss, not only in terms of, of quantity, in terms of test weight that is lost, but also due to the mycotoxins, mainly dioxin valino or DON for short. And so uh, we need to be aware that the risk is high. And again, if wheat is coming into heading and shortly into flowering, then we should plan a fungicide at flowering timing. And this will also help us control leaf diseases that may develop uh, on the flag leaf and the leaf blow flag leaf. So with that, uh, here's the summary of uh, what I tried to present this afternoon. Um, so we need to know the field history and we need to select cultivars carefully so we can prevent root rots and uh, seedling rots that may affect uh, plant stand establishment, but, as, but also uh, plant vigor. So knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing the field history uh, where we know that we've had issues like Phytophthora or uh, sudden death syndrome is gonna help us to determine whether we need a specific variety to use uh, and also to plan uh, acid treatments. If you have Phytophthora in the past and you've used certain uh, RPS genes that are not effective, uh, please send us a sample so that we can um, test and determine the specific RPS isolate that you have in your field. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that would help you to know the best variety to deploy to manage Phytophthora root and as I mentioned, we cannot control these leaf, uh, root rot diseases in season. So we need to plan ahead of time, uh, things like variety selection or seed treatment in order to control uh, these diseases that will cause plant stand uh, issues. Um, we need to continue scouting in order to determine the type of disease that is developing as well as uh, the level of the disease. Of course, this will help us to know uh, if we have a virus, we don't have to apply anything in the field. If we have a bacterial disease, we don't have to apply anything in the field. But also if we have transport and it's only developing on the lower leaves, probably we don't have to worry yet. Uh, so scouting is important uh, to help us again, know the different problems we're having and the level of these diseases in the field. And we also know that a well-timed fungicide will help us to prevent yield loss, especially for certain diseases that we know can cause severe yield losses like Fusarium head blight, like uh, frog leaf spot, like uh, uh, tan spot and rust diseases. So we need to scout. And then if the level of disease calls for a uh, fungicide application, that fungicide is applied in time at prevent yield loss. And of course, make sure that we have uh, a return on investment uh, when we're using these products. So with that, um, uh, that, that comes to the conclusion of my presentation. Here's my contact information for anyone that has a question on any diseases, please uh, feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending. As the title indicates, we're going to be talking about some early season insect pests, and we're going to be covering just a few and a couple different crops. So we'll, uh, we'll 
not focus just on one crop for the uh, talk today. So I didn't start with this last week, but this week I want to give everybody a little bit of an update on, you know, who am I? If you've never seen me give a talk before, I'm Adam Varenhorst. I'm originally from Northwest Iowa, and here's a picture of me and my dad. We're out scouting a field. So you can see I started my interest in insects and IPM and scouting very early. And so that's really how I got started in all of this. So we're going to get started today in alfalfa. The biggest early season insect pests that we see in alfalfa, typically year after year, are alfalfa weevils. The adults and the larvae both can feed on the alfalfa. They generally affect our first cutting really hard and then also the subsequent regrowth. So the issue here is if you let this pest get to very large populations, they can actually cause some stunting and can really reduce the next cutting also. The larvae feed on the terminal buds and also on the new leaves. So that's where that reduction and regrowth occurs when they're feeding on the buds. And both of them will leave circular holes on the leaves with the larva causing most of the issues. So here's what that defoliation injury from the larva and the adults looks like on the leaves. So you can see the leaves actually start having kind of a white appearance and then you see a, a ton of little holes all throughout the leaves. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And a lot of times when we're scouting, we'll be out in the field and you don't even need to get close to see what's going on because a heavily infested field with a lot of leaf feeding occurring will actually have what we call a frosted appearance. So the leaves actually start having that white appearance and when you have enough of that occurring, parts of the entire or the entire field can actually start looking like they're turning white. And so that's a sign that things are already probably a little too late for that cutting, but the management's going to be for the subsequent growth in that field. So to scout for alfalfa weevils, we recommend looking at 30 stems. The easiest thing to do is actually pull the plant to shake it in the bucket, or if you're uh, not wanting to pull the plants, you can put the bucket down by them and kind of hit them into the bucket. So the whole idea there is you're dislodging the larva from the, the actual stems where they're feeding. Once you do that, then you're going to look in the bucket and you're going to count them. Uh, so, uh, and take an average, so you get your total divided by 30. Another thing you need to do is figure out how tall the alfalfa is, uh, because I gave you a threshold down here, typically the economic thresholds between one to four weevils per stem. However, if you look at our articles on the extension website, these are actually dynamic and they vary based on the growth stage and height of the alfalfa. So the smaller the alfalfa, the lower the threshold versus the larger the plant that can handle a little bit more weevil pressure. So for management options, they do put down a a lot of the literature will tell you that a cutting can sometimes reduce the pressure of the alfalfa weevils. Uh, another option are foliar insecticides. The big thing with the foliar insecticides is you really need to watch the pre-harvest interval that's present on the label. The reason for that is if you're close to cutting anyway, you notice that you have alfalfa weevil pressure and you spray, some of these pre-harvest intervals can be up to a week. Um, in those cases, you probably don't want to have to cut, uh, cut and wait a week before you can actually uh, bale, or you don't want to have to wait a week before you actually cut, uh, because then you're going to be just uh, losing some time out in the field. So really watch that. One of the things we've seen in scouting for alfalfa weevils is that sometimes people do use the cutting management approach. However, if the populations are very large and there are a lot of larvae out in the field, what we've actually seen is the larva will move out of a windrow of the cut hay and go back into the stubble of developing plants. And essentially then you get a clear cut uh, because there isn't a lot of leaf material left there and they actually will go through and cut anything and feed on anything that's left. And so one of those things to really watch for and try to manage. Now, there are other weevil larvae out and also adults out in alfalfa. So we need to make sure we're identifying the correct ones. So the alfalfa weevil larvae at their largest stage before they pupate and turn into adults are about three eighths of an inch long. 
so they're smaller before that. As you can see, they're green. They have a white stripe. It's a little bit hard to see here. They have an almost black head, so it's a really dark brown, almost black. And another key thing is in the, the picture I showed, and the reason we see those frost leaves is these feed primarily on the upper parts of the plant. Now, if we contrast that with the next larva, these are clover leaf weevil larva. These are a little bit larger, so they can be a half an inch long. A big characteristic difference is that these have a very light brown head. So compare that to the dark brown in the previous picture. That's kind of a key thing to look for. Another big difference is these feed on the lower leaves of the plant. So you're not going to notice these until you actually dig down into the canopy a little bit and look at those lower leaves. If we look at adult differences, now this is where it gets a little bit trickier because the adult differences aren't as easy to tell in my opinion, but this is an alfalfa weevil adult. So at their uh, adult stage, they're a quarter of an inch long. They're light brown to gray, so they have a little bit of color variation. The big thing though is they have this kind of, it's a dark band that runs down the middle of their body. And now there is some variation with this. So some of them will have a more pronounced band than others. But if you look for this solid dark kind of a stripe down their back, starting at their head and going behind them, that's what you look for. The clover leaf weevil adult is a lot larger than the alfalfa weevil adult. It has a brown body. The big thing here, because it's kind of relative unless you have something out there to measure them. Uh, you're talking about maybe uh, somewhere between an eighth to a quarter of an inch difference, but in size, the big thing is these have numerous black lines that are separated by lighter colored lines. You can't see it so easy. It's a little bit easier to see here on the thorax, but you see the light colored lines and then the darker colored ones. On the abdomens, there's just tons of the stripes. So there's not the solid black band. And so that's what you look for there. The reason we put this up is that although clover leaf weevils can be a, a problem and they are a pest of alfalfa, they generally don't cause as much of an issue as the alfalfa weevils do. Another pest that can be an issue early season on alfalfa are potato leaf hoppers. This is not as much of an issue as you head north for the first cutting. However, from season to season, it varies quite a bit. So these have to migrate from the southern United States each year. And as a result, depending on the season we're having, sometimes they show up a little bit earlier, sometimes a little bit later. Now, typically these are more of an issue for first year alfalfa. Now, the feeding from these a lot of times is mistaken for drought stress. However, in the last couple of years, we haven't had a lot of drought stress to complain about. It's actually been too wet. And so if you see the, uh, what looks like discolored leaves, chances are it could be from potato leaf hoppers. I don't have a picture here. We actually call it hopper burn and the outsides of the leaves begin to uh, discolor, kind of look like they're turning uh, reddish brown and that's hopper burn. That's actually from these uh, potato leaf hoppers feeding on the plants. So that's all I have for alfalfa. We'll be switching now to corn. One of our considered minor pests, but something we see a lot of, and sometimes we don't even realize we're looking at uh, its injury out in the field, is common stock borer. Now, the phase we care about them, the life stage is actually the caterpillar, like many of our insect pests. These are pretty distinctive when you're looking at them, though. Uh, very distinct color pattern, and they're not very large. They have three pairs of the true legs, the black ones up here, and then they have these four pairs of abdominal prolegs down here. Key characteristic though is what they call the purple saddle. So that's right here kind of in the middle of their body. So you can imagine, uh, kind of looks like a saddle on their body, just darker color than the rest and it actually stops the stripes that are otherwise running the length of their body on the sides. They have an orange head with a black line on each side. And if you don't see the caterpillar, which is possible, uh, you might see the defoliation they cause. So those feet on the leaves, they leave ragged holes and it almost looks like sawdust. That's, that's their excrement. 
as they feed on the leaves, they actually move down into the world. So that's why you might not see the caterpillar unless you pull the, the world part and actually start uncurling it. Younger corn is more susceptible to this feeding injury. And you won't see this as you move into a field. It's most common on the edges of fields. And a lot of times those plants will actually die or they get dead heart and they'll disappear. So to scout for this, you look for that feeding injury on the edges of the field. I've seen it go as far as 10 to 15 rows into the field. So a lot of times it makes it just to the edge of the border, doesn't make it into the center of the field. Most of the time, these are active from May to June. That's when you see the feeding. Once we get past that, they don't really have enough of an impact on the plant to cause a lot of issues. It's the earlier stage corn where you can have that dead heart occur. When you see the feeding on the leaves on the plant, you begin moving in. So you can see we just continue following the excrement and also the feeding until there's the caterpillar right there. So scout 30 random plants in the border rows and look for these. Now, I checked this yesterday when I was putting it together and uh, our market value is not quite where it was back when I put this together a few years ago. So one of the things to take into account is market values lower and that means the thresholds for this pest actually go up. So when you have a crop that's worth more money, thresholds go down because you want to have less injury to it. So what we see here is that it's kind of a dynamic threshold. Most of the time, you're not going to see a ton of economic loss to this pest. It's actually more of an issue of you don't wanna have dead plants on the edges of your field because that doesn't uh, look as nice and it also sometimes can be a potential issue in the future also. So this is one of those pests that we don't manage for a ton unless it's really bad. Now for management, one of the things we do see happen is that weeds are managed right around corn emergence and then we have more of an issue with the common stock borer. So if you wanna do weed management on the edges of the field, do it prior to corn emergence, which is easy to say during that time of the year, everybody's very busy. And so sometimes things have to wait a little bit. Foliar insecticide management for this pest has to be applied while the larvae are moving from their weedy hosts into the field. So when you first start seeing that defoliation on the leaves, that's when you, you can't wait too much longer uh, to actually spray. And most of the time, only the first four to six rows of the corn need treatment. And most of the time, most fields don't get treated because the pest just isn't present in large enough numbers. Another pest that can cause a lot of headaches during the spring are black cutworms. These are something that also have to move up from the southern United States. And so for South Dakota, sometimes they get here a little bit later. They get their name because they have a darker color uh, than some of our other cutworm pests. We say that their skin kind of has a rough texture. Again, that's relative in comparison, but they do have a lot of ridges. And as I say, they vary in color from dark brown to black. So I said they migrate from the Southern US in early spring. So in South Dakota, we actually watch for our neighbors to the South for when they're seen uh, the uh, presence of these pests. And then we estimate when they're going to be present in South Dakota. One of the things we do know is that the female moths, as they move up and they're preparing to lay eggs, they're more attracted to wet and weedy fields. Now, if you think about last year, I didn't have a lot of reports of black cutworm, but we had ideal conditions in a lot of South Dakota. We had wet fields and we had increased weed pressure because of the excess moisture. As a result, this spring was a little drier, but we had a large weed seed bank. And so there's a chance that there were more weeds than normal out in some of those fields. And so we'll continue to watch for black cutworms and just make sure that they don't become a problem. We typically start scouting for these at corn emergence and continue through the fourth uh, vegetative stage. So when we're scouting for these, we examine 20 plants throughout a field. We determine management's necessary if 5% of those 20 plants are cut or have leaf feeding. So this is a picture of a cut plant. That's where cutworms get their names. They actually feed around the plant and cause it to fall over. 
if you have a lot of cutworms in a field, you can actually see large patches of cutting occurring. And that's not something you want to see. Now, I don't have it here. These typically are nocturnal feeders and they hide under soil debris and debris during the day. And so for management of these, you need to have kind of a large, uh, large irrigated treatment when possible, or we need to make sure we're treating later in the day when it's closer to when they're actually going to be coming up so that we still have some residual when they're moving to feed on the plants. So for management of these, uh, BT corn hybrids that express Cry1F can work well, can reduce their feeding. Uh, also foliar insecticides applied late in the day. So uh, that's, that's the best we can do for black cutworms. Now these aren't typically widespread, they are more of a sporadic issue. Uh, but looking at the last year with a lot of the prevent plant acres as well as just continued wet conditions in some parts of the state, this is something that we will be watching for. We're going to switch gears now from corn to soybean. Soybean have a couple defoliators we really watch for early season. First is green clover worm. These have three pairs of true legs and up here and then three pairs of abdominal pro legs. Now this is important because as we get later in the season, there are some other green caterpillars that will show up in soybean and the easiest way to tell them apart is to look at how many of these pro legs they have. Now, it does say they migrate from the southern U.S. during a nice winter. These can overwinter in some parts of uh, Iowa, as well as maybe even southeast South Dakota. However, it has to be a really nice winter. Uh, so a lot of times they're a later issue in the season. However, I've seen these show up early season. And when they show up early season, sometimes it's very large populations very rapidly. I don't have anything else for these, but watch for defoliation. These guys will be present on the leaves, so they make fairly large irregular shaped holes. And then you'll see a lot of caterpillars present also. So that's something to watch for as we get into soybean emergence. Probably our most important and biggest impact factors for early season soybean are bean leaf beetle adults. So the adults can vary in color quite a bit. They can be brown, this one's more of a yellow color, orange, or even to red, uh, just varies. Those are the main colors though. So for identifying these, we look for a couple key characteristics. The first one is they have a black triangle right here that's located behind the head and thorax. So you look for right here, this is kind of a black triangle, you look for that. And then most of them will have four spots on these hardened forewings. Now, as you can see, the spots aren't always as clear on all the beetles. Some of them will be kind of blurred together. Some of them uh, have spots that are barely visible. So this is the easiest way though. They almost always will have this black triangle. The spots can vary, the colors can vary. So for bean leaf beetles, we actually in the spring are looking at the overwintering population. They overwinter as adults. They emerge from wherever they were hiding and they actually begin feeding on alfalfa first. They wait until soybean emerges and as soon as soybean starts emerging, they'll move into the soybean fields. Where they will feed on the leaves, they'll leave small circular holes and with a large population of bean leaf beetles, you can actually have quite a bit of defoliation occur. The threshold for these is 30% defoliation prior to flowering. We go with the defoliation because bean leaf beetles are kind of timid and they, are act they will actually fall off the plants as you get closer. If they see your shadow covering the plant, they'll drop into the soil. So it makes these a little bit harder to scout for based on populations. Next, we're going to talk about a new soybean insect pest that actually starts causing issues early season. So the issue with this picture here is right along here. So this is corn, this is beans. I've shown this picture a lot. So if you've seen it, I apologize, but it's kind of a key characteristic we look for. You'll notice that there's dead soybeans and a lot of people's first impressions are, well, that's probably a little bit of drift, whatever the herbicide they sprayed on the corn drifted a little bit, caused this issue. However, both the corn and the soybean were Roundup ready, treated with Roundup, so we shouldn't see a lot of injury like we're seeing here. 
To make it more interesting, this is a picture that was taken later season. This is the same field, different perspective with a drone. And what we see here is that we still have the dead plants along the edge. You'll actually notice that weeds started to emerge because there was no cover, because there's no soybeans there. The dead plants are actually moving into the field further now. Plants are starting to senesce. This was later August uh, when the picture was taken. But there's a lot of discoloration that should be occurring right on the edge of the field. And what's really interesting is this field was pretty contoured due to the hills. But if we follow the edge, of, we see it goes way back quite a ways, uh, pretty much the entire line between the corn and the beans. So what was going on? We know there's dead plants. We look at more fields and we notice that we see more dead soybean plants, almost always either between on the edge of uh, the soybean where it's meeting corn or where it's meeting a road ditch or a tree line. And when we started inspecting these plants, we noticed that they had some key characteristics. One of them was that there was a discoloration near the soil surface. So here's a soybean plant early season. This is only about a V2, V3 V plant. What we see though is right here. This is the discoloration we're looking for. I took a picture a little bit closer so you can see it. Soybeans always are a little discolored near the soil surface, but it's this kind of dark brown, almost a purple color that we're looking for right here. And it's always near where there was a natural split in the stem. When soybeans are developing early season, they grow really rapidly, and that's what causes these splits to occur. Generally though, those would heal up and you won't notice anything. Another key characteristic in these plants we are seeing was that they uh, break very easily. So they were prone to lodging. And it almost always broke right around discoloration. Now, if I go back a slide, one more thing we notice is that it's, it's almost impossible to tell, but it's there. There's a little bit of swelling right here. So kind of around the stem where there's that discoloration in relation to the rest of the plant. So you'll notice there's just a little bit of swelling on both sides right there. And that's again where they are breaking. We look later in the season, the discoloration is still present. There's a white fungus growing on the plant. This wasn't white mold, we had it tested. Uh, it was a white saprophytic fungus. We believe it was feeding on plant nutrients that were uh, coming out of the plant right above where you can't see in the picture. Uh, plants in this field were actually uh, weeping in the afternoon, so there's moisture coming out of the plant. Another thing, again, is the lodging. It becomes more pronounced later in the season. So when we started digging under the epidermis of these plants, we noticed a, key, a common factor. These small orange or white larvae were present under the epidermis. So these are soybean gall midge larvae. Back when we first saw these, they weren't feeding on the plant, they were feeding on that white fungus that we saw on the plant. As we move forward into the future though, uh, to where we are now, they're feeding on the plant. And uh, we're not sure why things changed, but these do appear early season and they can show up in pretty large populations. So you can see here, there is a little bit of that white fungus here on the plant, but you actually can see discoloration now on the stem itself uh, where these guys are feeding. So they're not all present where the white fungus is, they're kind of everywhere on the plant. Early season, we start scouting for the soybean gall midge adults. The adults are a quarter of an inch long from the front leg, tip of the front leg to the tip of the back leg. These are going to be kind of hard to identify because there are a lot of small flies out in the field early season. So what we actually are using are modified corn rootworm emergence traps. We're using those to catch the adults as they're coming out of the soybean stubble. These have orange abdomens. And the biggest characteristic we've used for identification is the legs. As you see, they have a light and dark alternating pattern. And this is what we see starting early season. We see plants that look like they're just wilting and dying. Once we start investigating, we see that uh, the soybean gall midge is under the epidermis. Now, what you see also in this picture, it's not as easy because it wasn't the main focus. There's the cornfield right there. So these, we found over winter in 
previous year's stubble. So this was a bean field the previous year and they emerged from that. So scouting early season, what we recommend looking for are wilting plants. Look for these discolored stems. Once you see that, look for the stem swelling or dead plants on the edges of the field. From there, you're going to have to use either your fingernail or a small pocket knife, pull back the epidermis, look for these larvae. The reason we care so much is when we look later in the season, we're seeing that we can have quite a bit of yield loss. So field edges can vary quite a bit from 10 to 100% yield loss, and it varies how far into the field that goes from field to field. Entire field averages though have been observed to be reduced between 10 and 50%. So something that we really need to keep an eye on. So far, it's been confirmed in 96 counties and five states. It's a new pest. It was first identified last spring. Uh, is a new species, so it wasn't reported anywhere else in the world, just in these five states. Missouri hopped in uh, a year ago. They had one county where they found it. It wasn't a surprise, though. If you look at Nebraska and even Iowa, that county was surrounded. We have it also in South Dakota, and it's something we'll continue watching for. I don't have any management recommendations up here, and that's because we don't have any at this point. Right now, we're working on figuring out this, the distribution of this pest, where it's at, where are the hardest hit areas. So far, it looks like our counties down here in the southeast are hit the hardest, especially Union County. One of the things we're seeing is that people are applying foliar insecticides for this pest. That's off-label um, because this pest isn't present on any labels yet because it's so new. And another thing is we've observed that the adults don't emerge in one large flush. They actually have an extended emergence, which means we can't really hit the populations very easily. And what we're worried about is that a lot of these foliar applications occurring for this pest could potentially lead to uh, actually having insecticide resistance before we ever even know how to manage it properly. So we're not recommending uh, using foliar insecticides on a routine basis to try to keep this pest out of the field. So we'll wrap up. I have a couple minutes it looks like left on wheat. Main early season pests in wheat are cutworms. So the army cutworm and also the pale western cutworm. So you can tell why this guy's called the pale western. It's lighter color than the army cutworm. Army cutworms are mainly a pest of winter wheat. So the moths come back from the Rocky Mountains in the fall. They lay the eggs in established winter wheat fields. The larvae become active, the caterpillars again in the spring, typically mid to late April is when we notice the feeding. So on a typical year, we'd say we're past that. However, these cold periods we had that we talked about last week, uh, whether the weather is affecting pests. We might be a little behind schedule on the army cutworm feeding, but chances are they've moved on and are probably headed back to the Rockies. So we're mainly watching for pale western cutworm. These are a pest of spring wheat from May to June. They feed through the stem and kill the plant. Army cutworms mainly just feed on the, the leaves. The plants can actually grow back out of that. So We'll watch for pale western cutworms. I've had no reports about them yet. Some other early season insect pests and in wheat we watch for, but we haven't seen a lot in the last few years, are aphids. The three species we really watch for are bird cherry oat aphid, English grain aphid, and then also the green bug. These are vectors of barley all dwarf virus. Typically their activity in the fall and winter wheat is more of an issue because we see a lot of times that the barley yellow dwarf fire shows up in the spring in the winter wheat. They can also reduce yield through direct feeding. We have thresholds up on our extension website for these, but like I said, we haven't seen really any issues with aphids in the last few years. So that's all I have for you guys today. Thanks for your attention. If you need to get a hold of me right now, the best way is to send me an email, which my email is right here. Adam.Barenhorse at sdstate.edu.